You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 382, Revelation 12. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Well, not a whole lot. If, uh, boy, well, maybe I I shouldn't say that. You know, I I took some abuse on social media, so I guess that's new. Oh, yeah? Um, What what happened there? I don't don't know if you saw that. Well, I... A podcast I was on sent me a shirt, blurry creatures, and it had a, a picture of an eye on it. So now I'm now I'm a mason. Oh, yeah. I, I, th- I think I'm a mason well, or an Illuminatist or something like that. So it'll go on my resume at my, my application for the Illuminati, for sure. Um, we have an eye for the paranormal logo. So I mean, oh, I know. I don't but, know. But these the. the the people with with these you know steel trap minds you know who are are, are thinking that. You know, I'm some occultist now. They never, they never actually noticed that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there you go. My question though is, if if you think about the paranormal eye, you know, the the quote unquote eye of God, you know, it's it's been artistically styled, of course, but it's a, it's that astronomical photo, the eye of God, with I guess it's a galaxy or something yeah. in the shape of an eye. My question is, how did the Masons get those stars to line up like that? Like, how'd they get them out there? And then how'd they create the eye in, in deep space? Aliens. That's Mike. impressive. Come on. No, aliens. Come on. Oh yeah. That's right. That's right. They're, They're in the league with aliens. the aliens. Exactly. I've, gosh. I hope they don't, I hope the Illuminati test doesn't have that question on or else I'd fail. But mm-hmm. anyway, we're we're still working on it. We're yeah. Still working on <laughs> the application. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's frustrating out of all these years. I mean, gosh, and they still just when anybody just doesn't understand anything in context now frustrates me, you know, especially, you know, you, they take the stuff out of context and they don't take time to understand anything and they make assumptions and, or they write a review about your book and they don't, you know, get the full picture. It's just frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah so in the last month I found out I was an amillennialist and a Freemason. So I'm, uh, I'm having a good month, you know? Yeah. yeah that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should like get a, you know, like a, a monk costume, you know, like a, a robe or something or, you know, like with a hood and, and put it on one of the pugs and then he could be like, he could be a Jesuit, Pugnacious Loyola. Uh, that, maybe that'll help. Judd Burton suggested that. I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, that's perfect. F- for us in the know, it is funny, but it just frustrates me. People are going to take that out of context and spin it, you know, to make something that's just not true. It's it absolutely gets me yeah. frustrated. I've had to, just calm down about stuff like that. And I, I really want to engage, but I don't engage purposefully, Mike, at anything. In the oh, I, I believe don't. me, I, I want to, I want to engage because I could just mock it all day long and it yeah. would just be so much fun. It, it, it would take up, it's not a good use of time. So yeah. And, and, and it's not good for your blood pressure. So no, that's, that's, well, it, it might be good for mine because it would be so much fun, but it's, it's still, not a good use of time. I think the we'll Lord probably to, would rather have to do something I, else. But I do enjoy when our listeners take up the sword and they'll fight the good fight. You listeners out there, if you, if you see it, feel free to engage. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So. Oh, man. Well, yeah, I mean, I can, I, I'll get some good laughs out of that, too. So that, that might be worth it. You know, you, you, it, it, it's worth it if it's funny. You know, it's... It, you, you, you got to have a little fun every day, you know? Yeah. That so, would be our advice. If you're going to engage, keep it funny You know, turn it hateful. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not, that's not the, it's not what the Lord would want you to do either. So well, Mike, you know, what can we say? Revelation 12, there's some stuff in this chapter. Right. So we, we move, we move from Mike's a Freemason to astral theology. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, actually, we're not going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the astronomical, uh, astro-theological stuff for Revelation 12 in this episode, because we already did that way back in episode 138, uh, which was actually, that, that, that uploaded December 25th, 2016, which was you know, sort of a tongue-in-cheek you know, date to put that up. Um, 
most of the, the, the listeners are going to know that I think that the astral imagery of Revelation 12 is uh, intentional and meaningful. And so I think if you, you know, I, this, this wasn't my idea. I mean, I'm, I'm getting this from earlier writers and so on and so forth. But if you plug that into an astronomy program and, you know, you, you match that with the, the whole Matthew 2 thing, the star of Bethlehem, what you get is you get, a, you get a date for Jesus' birthday, and it's not December 25th, which, of course, basically everybody knows that December 25th is an artificial date anyway. But if you want to know um, all that stuff as it relates to Revelation 12, go back and listen to episode 138. Um, and to get the date, to get, again, some good scholarly sources um, that address, you know, different aspects of that date and presumed problems, you know, with the date, so on and so forth. Uh, you can get that back there. So we're not going to repeat that. Today we're going to pick up essentially with Revelation 12, verse 6, uh, once we get past that imagery, and then tie this in with Revelation 11, you know, I guess for, in terms of a strategy. And when, we're going to start Revelation 12, 6, and I'm going to just sort of summarize things as the content of Revelation 12, 6, and following sort of coincides with or works in tandem with Revelation 11. And when we, we sort of go through this long summary that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have here, then we'll go back into Revelation 12, again, beginning in verse 6, and sort of drill down on a few particulars, a few you know, specific things in, in the passage. So Revelation 12, 6 says, The woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. In the last episode, you know, we, we we talked about the context for a lot of these numbers, and and again, it was intentionally kind of mind numbing because I want people to realize how complicated this is. Uh, you know, these numbers have a meaning in their original context, which in in this case, going back to the book of Daniel, where you get this twelve sixty or three and a half years, and you get twelve ninety and thirteen thirty five in Daniel. You know, so we, we talked about all these numbers and, and what calendar these numbers make sense in, the, the 360 days, specifically the Zetakite calendar. So we did all of that. And along the way, you know, I, I, I made the comment about um, the woman here in Revelation 12, 6, because you know, we're, we're trying to link the 1260 in Revelation 12 with some of the numerical language of Revelation 11. And so we spent some time doing that in the last episode to show that, that these, these two passages operate in tandem, and so therefore they ought to be interpreted in light of each other. Okay, let one chapter assist us in interpreting the other chapters. So the woman, I said in the last episode, w- was Israel. Yeah, I'm just going to go through sort of a, a running summary of a little bit from last week, tying it into Revelation 12, working through Revelation 12, and then we'll drill down on specifics and, and provide some data or some evidence you know, from the Old Testament. Uh, for for what you're going to hear here. So the woman I said was Israel, and the 1260 days operates in tandem with the same number in Revelation 11.2. That's where it occurs. And I suggested earlier in that last episode that as Revelation 12.6 is really you know descriptive of the persecution of Israel, the the, the people of God. When, when I when I say Israel, think people of God here. So Revelation 12, 6, the woman, i.e., you know, Israel, the people of God, flee into the wilderness because Israel is the one who gives birth to the Messiah. We know this isn't Mary because there's no New Testament account of Mary like being persecuted and having run into the wilderness, okay? So this is figurative for Israel, people of God, under persecution, in the days following the birth, the death, the resurrection, and of course the ascension of Jesus. So the, you know, since it's connected with Jesus, it's not just broadly Israel, the people of God, but but it's going to sort of narrow to believers. Now, that there's there's a debate among scholars whether, you know, we ought to think of the woman as believing Jews plus Gentiles who are the seed of Abraham, according to Paul. And again, Revelation is the last book here. So so we've had this, we, we have a sort of an accumulative theology built up before, before we even get to Revelation. So it's fair, again, to see Israel you know, through the lens of some of these other books in the New Testament. So there's a debate whether the Israel here is the true Israel, quote unquote, ethnic Jew plus Gentile, all everybody's a follower of Jesus, or if we should sort of divide it up into ethnic Jew just generally, what regardless of whether they accept Jesus as Messiah plus the church. Okay, so let's just set that aside for the moment. 
we're going to talk in broad language here. So we have the the woman fleeing, you know, after the death of the birth, and the, or the birth and the death and the resurrection ascension of Jesus, the child of Revelation 12, again, who is birthed in the chapter of Revelation 12, but also described as being caught up to God into his throne, again, which is a reference to Jesus' ascension, the ascension of the Messiah. So Revel- Revelation 11, 2, on the other hand, that has this, this numerical language, that has the people of God symbolized both by the temple language and the two witnesses under persecution. So what I'm suggesting is to look, to look at Revelation 11 too, like, like we did last time, we spent our time in Revelation 11. We wonder, well, what, you know, what's the temple thing there and, and the two witnesses, what are they? I'm suggesting that if we take, we link the number there to the number in Revelation 12, we find out that we should interpret these things symbolically, that the two witnesses are the people of God, the temple also speaks of the people of God because the temple, which is his body, the body of Christ, which is the temple, which is us. Okay, and all these, all these New Testament threads tying together. So the point is that if you take Revelation 11, 2 and 12, 6 together, linked by the 1260-day reference, then the following elements can sort of be listed and interpreted in tandem. Temple courts being trampled by the Gentiles. Okay, that's, that's a, a reference to Gentile persecution of the people of God. You have the two witnesses who oppose the Gentile trampling. They preach against it and ultimately succumb to their oppression, but are raised after three days. So what, you know, what, what's up with that? Again, you, you've, you've got this, essentially, you've got opposition to persecution. And basically, the, 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 you know, the people of God who are under persecution are going to suffer under it, but they're not going to be left for dead, you know, that, that sort of thinking. The woman who feels persecution, who is supernaturally rescued in language used to describe Israel's supernatural rescue at the Exodus is part of that. So this notion about the two witnesses, the people of God being, you know, raised up after three, you know, three days, I'm suggesting again, this isn't unique to me. It's, this is in a lot of commentaries that, that if we go over to Revelation 12 and we look at the woman that, that, and, and try to sort of align the messaging, what we get here is we have to notice that in the flight of the woman, the woman is supernaturally delivered. Uh, and it actually, there's actually a quote that we'll see a little bit later from Exodus 19 that, that ties Revelation 12, uh, verse 6, the flight of the woman, back to the Exodus. Okay, And so you have a supernatural deliverance. And that would make sense in, in, in the, the language in chapter 11 of the three days, the resurrection, and being snatched from death and, and alive. Okay, Now the wild card, and with all that, though, is, you know, John is writing post-Jesus, so he and his followers are, of course, included in the Israel imagery. That's pretty obvious. Offspring of the woman, Israel, are those who, in Revelation 12, verse 17, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, unquote. So it's very clearly followers of Jesus, okay, the church. Now, as I mentioned before, the, the question is, does that refer to the church alone, you know, composed of ethnic children of Abraham who believe in Jesus, and Gentiles who believe in Jesus, who are theologically called the seed of Abraham elsewhere in the New Testament, like Galatians 3? Or do we have a reference here to ethnic Old Covenant Jews and then New Covenant Jesus followers, like in separate groups? Again, that, that's one of those things that, that scholars will, will wrangle over. The first one makes more sense to me. That is what we have here in the Israel imagery is the church composed of ethnic children of Abraham uh, who believe in Jesus, they are believers, and then Gentiles who believe in Jesus, who are the spiritual seed of Abraham. And the reason I, I think that one makes more sense is because of Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. I'll just read that. Revelation 12, 10 says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Okay, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. It's a reference to the dragon or Satan, who accuses them day and night before our God. Verse 11, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. It's a very clear reference to the inauguration of the kingdom of God triggered by the, the work of the Messiah. So if that's the context for the Israel being persecuted here, it makes more sense to me anyway to, to say these are followers of Jesus. Because in verse 17, that, that's, where you, that's what you've got. 
The offspring of the women are, quote, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. All right? They are a, a new Israel, okay, it, it defined in New Testament terms. It doesn't, you know, negate Jewish presence in there. It doesn't negate an eschatological role for national Israel or anything like that. I mean, I, I've, I've beaten this drum, you know, re- repeatedly on this podcast. I, I don't like any of the systems. So I, I've said very plainly that I don't think supersessionism is, is the way to go. I think it says too much. I think it overstates the data. Um, the other side, I think, understates the data, the, the, the continuity here between or, or, or the composition of the church as, as a new Israel, not the new Israel, but a new Israel. Because Israel, ethically, I mean, Paul did write Romans 9 through 11, okay? That he, he's still concerned about his countrymen. The same guy that said that Gentiles are now children of Abraham is still concerned for his ethnic brethren and their conversion and their destiny out there in the future, their, their reawakening after the fullness of the Gentiles is accomplished. I mean, there, there's still a destiny out here for, for national Israel of, of, of something, okay? So, you know, that, that's what I think is going on with Revelation 11 and 12. Now, the question is, when, you know, this, the, whatever, this stuff that's described, when is this going to happen or, or did it happen? And, and, and again, the, the, the timing issue is a big deal because, again, the systems that, that try to approach the book of Revelation, they're, they're going to land somewhere on the when question. And, and again, this is just me talking now. I, I think all the systems are a little bit too sure about the, their answer to the when question. I think that, that, that this is a bit more open, a bit more elastic than, than either side sort of likes to admit. But a few thoughts here. Let's ask ourselves some obvious questions. Were Jews or Jesus followers rescued in 70 AD in a manner like under the miraculous deliverance from Egypt? In other words, when, when we get the woman fleeing into the wilderness, who is snatched up, you know, like she, she gets the eagle's wings. Okay, that, that's the Exodus 19, you know, reference. <sighs> when did that happen to the Jews in 70 AD? In the aftermath of the temple destruction. I don't think it did. I mean, I, I, what, what are you going to point to? So the, the content here of Revelation 12 doesn't really align very well with the idea that what's being described here is only about events of 70 AD. This is this is a significant missing element, okay? So if it doesn't sort of get its fulfillment in 70 AD, so you know, that would suggest there's a more distant future persecution and deliverance yet to come. Kind of like you know, some other aspects of prophecy. You have you have sort of an act and then a reenactment, you have this re- repetitive cycles in, in scripture of prophetic things. You've got the already but not yet thing working. So I don't think we can pin this, you know, to, to 70 AD, because I don't, I don't know when the Jews got miraculously delivered from the Romans. You know, it seems like the opposite happened, okay? So it seems more coherent in light of the 70 AD problems in Revelation 12, 10, to see this persecution and deliverance as operating on an already but not yet continuum. Again, this is, this is my perspective here, and I think it's consistent with lots of other passages and lots of other themes, you know, in eschatology. What I mean by that is for sure after the ascension of Christ, okay, Acts chapter 1, think of that. You know, after the ascension of Christ, you know, the kingdom and authority of Christ came, okay? Great commission wording, you know, all powers, all authorities given to me in heaven and on earth. We have the new covenant, you know, inaugurated at Pentecost. I mean, all these things are happening. We have the kingdom, you know, in Revelation 12's language, you know, we have the the kingdom. Let me go back to verse 10 and just read it again to you. The kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Okay, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. So for sure this stuff's happening. And for sure Satan's claim over, the pe- over people as Lord of the dead ended when the kingdom begins. Now, I, you know, my view, and you know this from Unseen Realm, is that this, this is either proleptically foreshadowed in Luke 10 or Luke 10 marks the beginning. You know, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I, I have... I take that as sort of a legal, if, if I can use that terminology, a judgment on Satan, basically telegraphing the idea that if you are a member of Christ's kingdom, which we're starting now because I'm sending out the 70, giving them power over demonic forces and so on and so forth. If you're a member of Christ's kingdom, Satan has no claim on you. He can flap his gums all he wants to. Because if you're a member of Christ's kingdom, you will have everlasting life. Death has no, no longer has dominion over you. 
Okay, he has no power over you. He has no authority over you. You are a member of, of Christ's body and his kingdom, okay? So that, that language here in Revelation 12, again, is, is, I think, working in tandem with Luke chapter 10 and, and, and some other passages too. So for sure, Satan has no ownership over, you know, he can't bring any meaningful accusation against anyone who's part of the kingdom of God. So that, for sure, that, that's the case. And also for sure, believers were persecuted. Okay, all these things are, are transparent. Neither the kingdom nor the opposition ended in 70 AD. This is my point. Okay, if, if all the if if this kingdom stuff precedes 70, and it and it it has to, I think, with Luke 10 and, and a few other things, Paul's statement in Colossians, we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay, if if the kingdom is around conceptually prior to 70 AD, well then. We would expect if 70 AD is the culmination of prophecy or something like that, that, that it would go away or be altered or something, or, or there'd, this, there'd be this miraculous deliverance on the other side of it. And, and we don't have that. So there must be a future day of the Lord. There must be a future persecution. There must be a future deliverance, and there will be a future kingdom consummation. So... These the, these images in Revelation 11 and 12, again, I'm taking together in tandem to, that they describe the persecution of the people of God, you know, in, in what they certainly imagined to be, you know, the, the, the last times. But the way it worked out was, you know, we don't have the fulfillment of all these things at that time, at that historical time in, in 70 AD. You know, the day of the Lord context, you, you go back to Revelation 11. Okay, verses 15 through 19, you get all this Sinai imagery, you know, the flashing lightning and all this kind of stuff. Well, again, all of those things, the Sinai imagery we've seen before in the book of Revelation, we've seen plenty of the, the antecedents for those things in the Old Testament. It's day of the Lord imagery, it's judgment imagery, so on and so forth. And the Lord will return to earth, will come to earth, you know, Christ will, will return and punish the wicked and vindicate his own people and rescue them, you know, on into you know, the eternal state, the new, you know, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and all these things that we're familiar with. So I think all of that is, is, is actually fairly clear. But the mystery here is the timing, again, which is related to the number of days. So how does this futuristic stuff relate to these numbers? Because the numbers sort of look specific, you know. And in discussing Revelation 11 last time, I suggested based on the observations of Boccaccini, okay, we, we read long sections of his article, the suggestion is that Daniel 12 gives us the when answer in association with those numbers. And so this is why he argued that Daniel situates the 1260, 1260 days, which is the same as saying a time and a times and a half time, three and a half years. That that's, you know, 1260 days by, again, a very specific calendar. And then the 1290 is adding a solar month, 30 days to it. And then the 1335 is adding another solar month plus a half solar month, 45 more days, and you get 1335. And at the conclusion of the 1335, you have, that's the time of the very end, you have the, again, that takes us in in the book of Daniel to the general resurrection. You know, after the day of the Lord, this this is when, when, you know, everything ends. This is the end of days. So, again, there's day of the Lord stuff in Revelation 11, there's Day of the Lord stuff in Revelation 12. There's certainly Day of the Lord stuff in the book of Daniel that links back into this. And why don't we just read, you know, we, we've actually covered a little bit of this in earlier episodes of the podcast. When we get to, uh, when we talked about phrases like Great Tribulation and how it links back to Daniel. But let me just read Daniel 12 so that you can see how Daniel 12, lo and behold, sounds like stuff in Revelation 11 and 12. Because <laughs> This is where he's getting it. This is where John's getting it. So here's Daniel 12, starting in verse 1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. Let me just stop there. We referenced Daniel 12, 1 in earlier episodes of the podcast, where we had phrases like great tribulation, or again, a, this, this unprecedented time of trouble. And, and we, we talked about the linguistic connections between those phrases in Revelation and here in Daniel 12, 1. So it, 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 this language isn't used very often, but here it is. And here's the specific point. This great tribulation language in Daniel is not linked to the beginning of a seven-year period. It's linked to a time that will coincide, the, the, the end of it when it's over, with the general resurrection of the dead. 
Okay. The, 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 essentially the great white throne, you know, idea. So, so that alone, you know, sort of, you know, impinges upon traditional pre-millennial systems. In my view, it does not rule out the, the return of Christ and the rule of Christ literally on earth. Because I think that's really talking about the new earth, not, not a, a thousand year millennium according to, again, some of these systems. So I'm, that, that's why I'm not, I'm, you know, I, conceptually, I'm, I'm aligned with a premillennial thought. That, you know, the, the return of Christ is on earth. The nations will be reclaimed on earth in real time and all this sort of stuff. So I'm with it. But the thousand years is too limited because, again, in, in, I think the better view is that what happens after this time of great trouble and the day of the Lord, the return of Christ, is we get the new heavens and new earth. And when we get to Revelation 20, you know, because people are used to, used to, to reading Revelation as a linear chronology, and they're going to think Revelation 20 run, you know, interferes with that and so on and so forth. Well, again, well, according to one, one system of thought, it does, but according to other systems of thought, it doesn't at all. So it just depends. But, but I'm not an, an amillennialist, okay? Contrary to, to this reviewer, you know, that I, that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode who reviewed my demons book. No, I'm not an amillennialist, friend, okay? You can't say what I just said and be an amillennialist. I don't define the kingdom as some ethereal eternal state that, that isn't, isn't happening in real time on earth. Wrong, okay? But I'm not using the vocabulary that a premillennialist would, would be sort of intimately familiar with, okay? It's, 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 it's a little bit of it's an already but not yet thing in operation. And, and the final culmination is, you know, Eden returns to Earth like, like right here, not somewhere out in, in outer space or something, okay? It's here on the planet. Planet made new. Hit the reset button for Eden and all that sort of thing. So, back to Revelation, or Daniel 12. So, Daniel, you know, again, is told Michael will arise. There shall be a time of trouble such as, you know, been unprecedented. But at that time, he says, your people shall be delivered. Hmm. So there's that deliverance language again, okay? Your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Again, here's that general resurrection thing. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is our glorification. Okay? But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, which we've talked about before, who is above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and a half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, and when, when this persecution comes to an end, all these things would be finished. And it comes to... Uh, to the end at a time, at times, it had 1260 days. This is where the numbers come from. Verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. And I said, O oh Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. I recall from Boccaccini again, you know, the, the, again, the, the two verses here that, that he fixates on are the verses 11 and 12. From the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So that, that's something, again, you know, do we, do we have here this abomination thing is the trigger point, and then we go 1,260 days plus 30, 1,200, that's what, it, that's what it seems like. And then the real blessing comes with an extra 45 days, this 1,335. And again, I realize this sort of flies in the face of, of eschatological systems, but I don't really care, you know, because th this is, we're, we're trying to align, you know, Revelation with Daniel, and we're trying to take the calendar 
that Daniel's thinking about and situated in, in its Jewish context. And we're not trying to situate it in the context of, a, of an eschatological system. So the assumption is that the day of the Lord clock starts ticking when the abomination happens. Then it's 1260 days plus 30 more. Now, Boccaccini says, he actually starts talking about Passover at this point, if you remember the last episode. You know, he, he links this extra 30 days to Passover. Well, why? It's because he apparently presumes that this three and a half years completes the last seven-year week or cycle in the 360-day calendar. Passover would be in the first month of, of like the next year, okay? So this Passover, in his thinking, apparently, is something that happens after the close of this last, you know, cycle. Okay, it brings it to an end. And now this, this Passover in his thinking accounts for the next, spilling into the next 30-day month, again, in the solar calendar. Now, for Christians, this, is the, this would be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lamb, marriage supper of the Lamb, Lamb, Passover, okay? This is, this is like a heavenly Passover thing because Jesus is the Passover Lamb. So if, if we were plugging this into sort of more familiar language, You've got the abomination, you've got 1260 days, then it, that's going to spill over you know, into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then 45 more days after that, that, that takes you to 1335. Now you've got, again, the, the glorification of the believer. You have the, you have the great white throne judgment and you know, everybody's resurrected and you know, to you know, everlasting life or everlasting death. Okay, that's, when, that's how this plays out just in a, in, in a reading if you're following the Zetakite calendar logic that we talked about last time with Boccaccini. Again, this is, this is all he's trying to do. He's not arguing for a particular eschatological system. He's trying to come up with an explanation for the numbers that makes sense in a calendar Daniel would have known and used. That's all he's doing. Now, what's interesting is, is if, you, if you go back and sort of look at the calendar, that extra 45 days brings us to the month wherein would occur the Feast of Shavuot, which we mentioned last time. That's the, the, the Feast of the Harvest, okay? The Feast of Weeks. The harvest is complete. That, that, that festival in the Israelite calendar is something that would take place when the harvest was brought in. So in this system, if you want to call it a system, in this reconstruction, the 1335 signifies the harvest is now complete, which would make sense because now you've got the, the general resurrection. The end comes. Okay, and the final resurrection, final judgment. Now, what's interesting is that if you're going by the old, you know, Israelite calendar, that's really close, the 45 days. It's really close to the marking of Pentecost, which would be 50 days. Now, I don't, you know, Boccaccini doesn't really deal with this. I don't know if, if we need to care. Is it close enough? I mean, who knows? But, but if you're thinking Pentecost, it's almost like as the Gentiles, as the harvest was begun, Speci speaking specifically of the fullness of the Gentiles at Pentecost. So it's going to end with another Pentecost. But this one would, will be the big Pentecost. Now, I don't know if that's correct, again, because it doesn't quite align, but it's very suggestive. I'm just throwing it out there. So we have the ingathering of the nations being complete. And the book of Revelation, by the way, after the great white throne, ends with that line about the healing of the nations. Is that a coincidence? Well, I don't know. You know, again, there, there are these things to think about because what John's doing is he's linking his language back to Daniel. He's linking his language back to a, a sacred calendar, you know, so on and so forth. And so this is what, this is how we're trying to contextualize what's going on in Revelation 11 and 12. So after this long persecution, the woman and her offspring are, are persecuted. They're going to be preserved. Okay. At, at the end, and, and, and how, are they, how are they delivered? Well, some are going to survive it, but some are going to be delivered. They're, they're all going to get eternal life, everlasting life in the new, you know, the, the new Eden, the new kingdom, the consummated kingdom. They're miraculously delivered. They, they're present at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and they go off into the new Jerusalem. So, you know, again, these, these are big picture themes that we're talking about. Now, as a sidebar, <laughs> you know, we had an earlier episode, episode 206 on the Feast of Booths, Sukkot, which, again, would, would follow in this reconstruction, uh, you know, by, by several months. Now, the, the, the Feast of Booths, ultimately, the, the reason we did this, this episode, episode 206, 
was that there are 70 bulls mentioned in Numbers 29. And, and there were some that were arguing that, that these, these are offerings to the, to the national gods, the 70 gods of the 70 nations, and so on and so forth. And, and I, I took objection with that. Uh, I think rather, according to Zechariah 14, 16, Sukkot 70 bulls would be the time when the remnant of the Gentile nations celebrates Sukkot in Jerusalem. Okay, when they are reclaimed and now loyal to Yahweh. So maybe that follows as well. Maybe, maybe there's actually the celebration of the, the epic Sukkot by the Gentiles regrafted into the family of God in the new earth. Maybe, maybe that's how we should be thinking about this if we want to align it with some of these other calendrical things. You know, it's all, it's speculation. We, we don't know this for sure. You know, in Revelation, this would occur in the New Jerusalem, this, this ultimate Sukkot. Oh, the nations are back home, which is kind of an awesome image when you think about it. But, but the, other, the, the flip side of that is in the, in the New Jerusalem, there's no sun. In other words, there's no time, there's no calendar. So like, how does, this, how does this factor out? How does this figure out? Yes, Revelation 22 has the angel showed me the river, the water of life, flowing from the throne of God, the land in the middle of the street. You know, we have the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit you know, yielding its fruit each month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It, it, it's, a, it's a really wonderful capstone image, but, but I, I can't sit here and tell you that, that this is absolutely the way these feasts and festivals are going to work out in relation to Daniel and in relation to the language of Revelation. You could build that case. I, I've, just, I've sort of just sketched it here for you. But what we're trying to do, again, this, this series is the, the, the book of Revelation and the Old Testament. Okay, how, how does the Old Testament get used and repurposed here? And, and what my argument here is, again, building on the work of other people that's not original to me, is that we need to take the language of Revelation 11 and 12, hook it back into Daniel to understand these numbers, and then try to sort of extrapolate accordingly. And, and when you do that, you come out with these are these are symbolic things that the temple language in Revelation 11, the two witnesses language, the woman language of Revelation 12. This is symbolic for the persecution of the people of God who will ultimately be rescued supernaturally after a, a, a period of specific period of persecution this 1260 days. And then we have to go back to Daniel to, to, to think about the extra 30 days to get 1290 and then 45 more to get 1335. And so that the suggestion is though that might Daniel 12 might actually give us sort of the the chronology the, the flow of events and then you'd have to ask well what what are the numbers why the 30 extra days Bocaccini says well that's when they're going to be celebrating a, a, a you know an eschatological passover and for again for Christians that's the marriage supper of the lamb it's very obvious and then the next 45 takes us to the resurrection again either to eternal life or eternal death and we are, we are glorified, we're brought into the New Jerusalem, and then, again, in theory, we have the mega Sukkot to celebrate the return of the nations into the family of God in the New Jerusalem, where they will now be followers of Yahweh. Okay, that doesn't really conform to any typical Christian eschatological system. I mean, they're, they're, people are going to talk about it, but then they're going to throw in, you know, other certain assumptions, okay, that, that sort of are drawn from other theological systems. And if you want to do that, fine. My, my hope is that listeners will, will grab a hold of some of these ideas. And, and I'm not telling anybody to endorse or give up a, a, a system of end times. But what I'm saying is your system needs to sort of be rooted in an Old Testament Second Temple context. That, that's all. Now let's go back. That's my, that's my summary here. Let's go back and, and drill down into, into a few specific things. So Revelation 12, 6 and 13, this is the woman, again, who birthed the Messiah. So I'm going to read both of those verses so we have them in our heads. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. And then verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Again, the male child, of course, harkens back all the way up in Revelation 12 to, you know, verse 5. She, the woman, gave birth to a male child, one, is, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. It's just Jesus. It's the Messiah. But her child was caught up to God and his throne. It, it, Revelation 12, 5 doesn't go through the whole history of Jesus. It doesn't talk about his ministry and the crucifixion and the resurrection. 
it, it, it skips all the way to the ascension, caught up to God and to his throne, because that's the seat of authority. Because a few verses later, he's going to say in verses 11 and 12, okay, that the followers of the, of the lamb have conquered, you know, the, the, the dragon by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. Okay. There, there's victory here. We've got, again, this language of the, the kingdom again has come all these sorts of things that are going to be mentioned later in, in, in the book. So it, there's a certain logic to it, but re- let's just spend a little time on the woman. I'm going to quote from Beale and McDonough here, um, actually several times uh, as, uh, while we finish up the episode here, you know, during the rest of our time here, because they, they, they put things into a nice summary. This is from the, the, the commentary, the, the really massive commentary the, on, on the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament. And Beale and McDonough were the ones that wrote the, the section on Revelation. So they write this about this chapter. Okay, there are, are allusions in Revelation 12, 2, to Old Testament metaphors representing Israel as a pregnant mother whose birth pangs refer to the suffering of her foreign captivity with the imminent birth alluding to her future deliverance from foreign oppression and salvation, you know, i.e. through the Messiah. By the way, this, this, this birth pangs being equated with foreign captivity, when the Messiah comes, the exile ends. Okay, that, that, that's what's going on with that imagery. And they reference here Isaiah 26, 17 and 18 in the Septuagint, uh, Isaiah 66, 7 through 9, Micah 4, 9 and 10, Micah 5, 3 again. So we have the imminent birth alluding to her future deliverance from foreign oppression and salvation, where either, you know, in these passage, passages, you, you have either Judah or Jerusalem depicted, specifically as a woman in labor. So again, Isaiah 26, Isaiah 66, Micah 4, Micah 5. You, this image of, of Jerusalem as a woman in labor, ready to deliver in association with, again, this you know, the, the captivity, the exile, okay? and the deliverance, and so on and so forth. Again, that, that's not coincidental. Okay, so we, we have allu- an allusion by John to, to some of these Old Testament texts. Beale and McDonough say, also noteworthy is Isaiah 51, 2 and 3, and verses 9 through 11, which speaks of Sarah who gave birth in pain, unquote, to her child, the woman Zion, whom God promised to comfort in all her desert places redeeming her out of captivity, as he did at the Exodus when he, quote, cut Rahab in pieces and pierced the dragon. You know, that's, it's just interesting language in light of dragon, Revelation 12, the woman fleeing, getting miraculously delivered again. You know, Beale and McDonough say, note also that Zion is viewed as a mother with seed. Okay, again, with, with child. In Isaiah 54, 1 through 3, 61, 9 and 10, 65, 9. 65, 23, and Isaiah 66, 10, and 22. These prophetic texts, they write, themselves and Revelation 12, 2 were inspired by Genesis 3, 15, and 16, where it is prophesied that Eve will bear in the pain of birth a future seed who will smite the head of the serpent, which of course in Revelation 12 refers to Christ as the fulfillment. The Qumran text 1QH, that's one, you know, Qumran Hodayot, column 11, 7 through 12, makes use of similar imagery of a woman enduring the agonies of childbirth in order to bring forth a child who appears to be a messianic deliverer. So somebody at Qumran was tracking on the same thing that John winds up tracking on in Revelation 12. Let's go to Revelation 12, 3, or back to Revelation 12, 3. You have the dragon, again, the, the catalyst of persecution. Beale and McDonough write this. The imagery of the dragon is used throughout the Old Testament to represent evil kingdoms that persecute God's people. And this is in mind here. Dragon, dracon in Greek, is another word in the Old Testament for the sea monster that symbolizes wicked kingdoms that oppress Israel. It's you know, the, the Leviathan chaos image, okay? And they write, often the wicked kingdom of Egypt is portrayed by this emblem. God is spoken of as defeating Pharaoh as a sea dragon at the Exodus deliverance and at later points in Egypt's history. Psalm 74, 13 and 14, Psalm 89, 10, Isaiah 30, verse 7, Isaiah 51, 9, Ezekiel 29, 3, Ezekiel 32, 2 and 3, Habakkuk 3, 8 through 15. And they also say, see Psalm 87, 4, where Rahab is a synonym for Egypt. Rahab is is one of the words in Psalm 89 uh, for, again, the the chaos monster, all right? Also see Jeremiah 51, 34, where Babylon is the subject in the the same context 
and also Amos 9.3. So the, the, there's a lot going on here with dragon imagery and Babylon and Egypt, okay, the enemies of God and so on and so forth. And the Egypt, the Egyptian connection is interesting because, again, the woman that's going to be delivered in Revelation 12, she's given eagle's wings. Again, that, that harkens back to the Exodus 19 passage. You know, again, what John's doing is is he's he's describing something, but he's linking it back again to certain events and images back in the Old Testament. Beale and McDonough also write the image of the dragon in Revelation twelve three represents the devil. The confirmation of this is in verse nine, who instigates the evil kingdoms of the world to persecute God's people. So we're not forgetting the devil in all this. It's very clear language in Revelation twelve. Now. Of Revelation 12, 6 again, in light of the dragon stuff and the flight of the wilderness, Beale and McDonough add this. The fleeing into the wilderness is an allusion both to Israel's exodus from Egypt, and think of the dragon and Egypt connection, and the anticipated end-time exodus, which was to occur during Israel's latter-day restoration from captivity. First, it refers to the time when Israel fled from Egypt into the wilderness and was protected and nourished by Yahweh. Again, think of the think of the harvest. Think of you know the Sukkot. I mean, all all these things again. This, this pre- preservation motif. All right, God providentially preserving you know His people. And the verses you know that they have a whole grocery list of verses for you know referring to when Israel fled from Egypt into the wilderness and was protected by Yahweh. Exodus sixteen thirty two. That's the manna passage. That one's obvious, but. Deuteronomy 2 7, Deuteronomy 8 3, Deuteronomy 8 15 and 16, Deuteronomy 29 5. And again, there's a whole grocery list here. I'm not going to repeat them all. They write the same pattern of fleeing into the wilderness is observable in the cases of Elijah, 1 Kings 17, 1 Kings 19, and Moses, Exodus 2 15. And they, they note here that Josephus, in his Antiquities, Volume 2, uh, 256, notes the same connection. So the same pattern of fleeing into the wilderness is observable in the cases of Elijah who, you know, Elijah and Moses, who symbolize the church in Revelation 11, 5 to 6. Now, let me stop there. Beale, you know, he, could, he, sh- he could have said the two witnesses who symbolize the church, again, which is what I've been saying. But he, he actually calls them Elijah and Moses. And, you know, he, he does that for, you know, for sort of obvious reasons. You know, Elijah was, was taken away and didn't die a natural death. And Moses is a little odder. Because Moses does die, at least according to the end of the Torah, um, you know he 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 doesn't land on, on Enoch anyway. But anyway, he's he's just saying that these two, the two witnesses, and where he lands as far as the Old Testament reference here represent you know the, the church, the people of God. So we're we're at the same place there. But I'm I'm not willing to be as specific as he is. So, you know, you, you could build arguments for Elijah, Moses, and Enoch, but we're not going to worry about that right now because again, it's it's all it's all speculative. It's much easier to say that the two witnesses represent the people of God. Back to Beale and McDonough, they say, the woman's flight into the wilderness also recalls the end time exodus or restoration when Israel would return to faith in the Lord and again be protected and nourished by him in the wilderness. Isaiah 32, 15, 35, 1, 40, verse 3, 41, 18, 43, 19, and 20. Again, the whole grocery list there. Judaism developed the belief that the Messiah would gather his people in the wilderness at the end time, partly on the basis of the aforementioned Old Testament eschatological texts, and especially by means of a typological, typological interpretation of Israel's Exodus wilderness experience. This belief is reflected in the writings of Josephus, where there is an explicit identification of first century messianic movements with the desert and Exodus themes. In Jewish Wars, uh, number, volume 2, 259 to 262. Jewish Wars, number 7, you know, 438 Antiquities, 20. I mean, there, there's a bunch of Josephus references here. The association of the wilderness with zealots and similar groups probably is part of this larger messianic expectation, at least according to Josephus. Again, that's, that's the trajectory he follows. Since here, this flight takes place immediately after the ascension of Christ, Revelation 12, 5, the woman's representative function now extends beyond ethnic Israel to all those who call upon the name of the Lord, Christians. Again, that's Revelation 12, 17. Uh, again, so we're tracking on the same thing. But let's go to Revelation 12, 13, and 14. This is the woman's deliverance in Exodus language. So here we'll get a few specifics. Beale and McDonough write this, the image of the woman flying with the two wings of a great eagle into the wilderness 
to a place of nourishment alludes to two Old Testament pictures and adopts them analogically or by analogy. First, 1214 reflects the picture of God as an eagle protecting Israel in the wilderness, which is an illusion combining Exodus 19.4. Let me just read that. Exodus 19.4, which says, again, this is spoken to the people of Israel. You yourselves, you know, God, this is from the mouth of God. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself, brought them to Sinai where, where the scene is taking place. So Beale and McDonough say this, what John's doing is, is he's alluding to Exodus 19.4, but he's also combining that with Deuteronomy 1, 31 to 33 and 32, 10 through 15. Let's just read Deuteronomy 32. Yeah, here we are in Deuteronomy 32 again. <laughs> so it says here, He, God, found him, you know, Jacob, in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him and cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them up on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. No foreign God was with him. He made him ride on the high places places of the land. He ate the produce of the field. He suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, so on and so forth. So it's God's protection using this eagle imagery. Beale and McDonough say this well-known image is also attested in the Psalms, where David repeatedly alludes to the Exodus figure by praying that God's wings will shelter him from persecutors and slanderers, the same protection needed by the woman in Revelation 12, 13 through 17. Now, if you, if you go to verse 14, let's, let's go to Revel, back to Revelation 12 here, pick up with one other thing. So Revelation 12, 13 was when the woman, again, is being pursued. 14, the woman's given two wings that she could, might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, again, to the place where she's nourished. And verse 15 has this, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood, but the earth came to the help of the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. And the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So there's this water imagery and this swallowing imagery, the earth swallowing up and so on and so forth. So that comes from the Old Testament too. Beale and McDonough say, the metaphor of an overflowing flood can have at least three ideas in the Old Testament. One, an army spreading out to conquer a country. That's Daniel 11.10, also verses 22, 26, and 40. Sometimes as an indication of divine judgments, the army spreads out. Sometimes it's it's in a judgment context. Psalm 88.7, Psalm 88.17, Isaiah 8.7-8, 8, Isaiah 17.12-13. Again, there's a bunch. There's references in Jeremiah, Hosea, Micah, Nahum. I mean, this is pretty common. So that's the first idea. Army spreading out to conquer a country or to, you know, it, you know be, be a tool of judgment. Number two is a more general reference to divine judgment, just, just more broadly. That's Psalm 32, 6, Psalm 90, verse 5, and 3. It can also, this imagery, this overflowing flood imagery can indicate persecution of God's people by enemies from which God delivers them. So 2 Samuel 22, 5, Psalm 18, 4, Psalm 18, 16, Psalm 46, 3, Psalm 66, 12, 69, 1 through 2, and a bunch of other Psalms, Isaiah 43, 2. Let's loop in Isaiah here. But again, this notion that, that this flood imagery can, can point to persecution. And so Beale and McDonough say the third idea clearly is what's in view in Revelation 12, 15. In Psalm 18, 4, David describes Saul's pursuit of him explicitly as, quote, the torrents of Belial assailing me, unquote. Of course, Belial, you know, it's, it's going to be later used as serpent Satan imagery. Beale and McDonough continue, the swallowing of the flood by the earth is a further allusion to the Exodus and Israel's wilderness experience. Believe it or not, listen to Exodus fifteen twelve. because we don't really associate this with the Exodus, but here it is again. So we've got here, let's see if I can find this reference here. The earth swallowed the Egyptians when they pursued Israel 
through the Red Sea. So Exodus 15, 12 says this. Now, this is in the Song of Moses. This is after the crossing of the Red Sea. And then you get this, this song in Exodus 15. Here's <laughs> Verse 11 is the one that we sort of all know. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds and doing wonders? Here's verse 12. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. Now, we, we think of the Exodus as, you know, Charlton Heston, okay? You know, the, the Egyptians all drowned and you know, the sea closes. And, and yeah, it did that. But, but here it actually says the earth swallowed them. And this is language. It's underworld language. You know, they're, they're, they're dead now. They're, they're being taken to the underworld and all this sort of stuff. But, but here we have this, this reference to the earth swallowing. Naturally, it swallows, you know, the Egyptians who are in the water. Again, you, you, have to think, you have to think metaphorically and, and symbolically. And that's not to say it's not a historical event. It is. But the way it's described, the terminology that's described is, you know, shouldn't just be left to literalism. I mean, yes, it has a literal reference, the event at the Red Sea. We get that. But, but the way the, that the water and the earth language are used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible denotes death and destruction and you know, being tanked in the underworld, okay? This is, this is the, the whole point. And so Revelation, Revelation 12, uses this imagery. It just sounds odd, but, but if, you, if you're familiar with the Old Testament context, the dragon again, unleashes this water, this flood, which again is one of the ways that you can understand that is water is used as a, an, an image of persecution. And then what does God do? The earth comes to the help of the woman, okay? And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river and the dragon that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Basically, just like the Exodus, the, the forces of evil get swallowed up, you know, including the river. The river goes down there too, you know, but it gets swallowed up by the earth. And it, it's 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 right out of Exodus, the book of Exodus again. So again, by way of summary, there, there there are plenty of Old Testament touch points here for viewing the woman of chapter twelve as Israel or the people of God. That that ought to be quite evident here. The metaphor is transformed though by being connected to the birth, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. You know, birthed by the woman. So that Israel ultimately here is the true Israel, those who embrace the Messiah regardless of whether they're ethnic Jews or not. You know, we can't take verses like Revelation 12, 17 seriously by isolating the language of Revelation 12 to Jews only, you know, ethnic Jews only. Just, it just doesn't work because of the other things that are talked about, the kingdom of Christ you know, in Revelation 12. Again, so, so this is, you know, it's it's a good way to understand the language, again, taken symbolically and metaphorically that has deep roots in the Old Testament. In a nutshell, that, that that's that's what we've seen here in this episode. This stuff has deep roots in, in the Old Testament, not just in terms of cross-references, but in terms of the conceptual metaphor of the vocabulary. It, it's used metaphorically in the Old Testament, so why shouldn't we read it metaphorically in Revelation 12, Revelation 11 and 12, when John's using that language from the Old Testament. And I'm suggesting we should. <laughs> you know, John's not really changing anything. You know, the, the context is a little bit different because it's post-Jesus. Okay, so you know, now Israel gets a little bit more of a, of a different definition. But, but John's using the language in, in, the, in the ways that you would find it in the Old Testament. So why don't we just follow his lead rather than you know, doing some of the stuff that you see in, in prophecy books and whatnot. So again, this is what we're trying to do here. We're trying to just loop the, you know, what's going on in Revelation, you know, connect it back into the Old Testament. And, and for those of you who, who are just, you know, in, in love with a particular system, you know, like I've, I said at the very beginning, be warmed and filled. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to, to adopt one or dump one. I don't really care. But what I do care about is that, is that you at least try, you know, you, you do due, due diligence to connect your thinking about interpreting the book of Revelation to the Old Testament passages that John very clearly is referencing and alluding to and repurposing in what he's writing. Yeah, Mike, that's why we need you to connect those dots, because I'm not going to be making those connections. Well, you, yeah, you could maybe just read Left Behind or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I just watch that movie? <laughs> I don't even want to read the left behind. I just want to watch the movie version. There you go. Gosh. Uh. <laughs>
I have not seen the movie version, so. Yeah. Have you yeah, read the I books? hope it was good. No, no, I haven't. Even, even, well, I, that's, that's a long story. But the guy who edited them gave me a, gave me a set for free, but I, you know, and he's, he's not, he actually, you know, w- without bringing his name into it, but the, the, the guy who edited the Left Behind series was not of the same end times uh, perspective as uh, LaHaye and Jenkins, but, yeah. you know, he, he, he was, he was something totally different, but he, yeah, yeah he gave me a set, but he, he didn't, he didn't assign them to me. He didn't say you have to read them, but he thought I'd like a set. So, yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. All right, Mike. Well, yeah, we will continue the March revelation 13 next week. Uh, still weird oh, yeah. stuff. There's still lots of weird stuff to get through. Get six, six, six and Mark of the yeah. beast and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Boy, I mean, Here we, we go. could spend, we could do some paranormal shows on that one. Uh, <laughs> I expect you to bring some yeah, computer chips and uh, all kinds yeah. of stuff into this Bar- next episode. Barcodes and computer chips. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. All right, Mike. Well, that was a good episode. We're looking forward to Chapter 13 next week. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.